So this morning we're going to engage uh, the topic of freedom. And we have these two marvelous interlocutors. I told both of them that I'm a hard chair, so 20 minutes is the limit for each paper. And then after that, we'll take a moment to catch our thoughts. And then I will bring the mic to you. I'm changing the, going more of a Phil Donahue, Oprah style. Oh. Jerry Springer style or something. Oh, I'm going to bring the man. mic to you okay. so you don't have to do that perp walk <laughs> to, the, uh, to the microphone. Anyway, so first we have Neil Roberts uh, who's uh, going to, oh, his title has changed, so I'll let him tell you about that, but Neil is over at uh, Williams and Africana Studies, marvelous text, Freedom as Marinage, that uh, has been so impactful, particularly for our Brown undergraduate community to see that uh, this brother was a Brown undergrad, played soccer, came through Africana, and has gone on to such marvelous, uh, reached such marvelous heights in the academy is marvelous. But then we also have Yasmin Sayadullah. <laughs> Did I get that right? No. Accent on the last syllable. Oh, OK. I was close, though. Um, and she's out at Vassar College. She'll be starting there. In, uh, she's been there for a while, but she's moving over to Africana Studies in the fall of 19 to do a thing on Africana and prison studies. Also, I'm about to say that now. You know, I'm not going to leave that out. We're claiming all our alums. Well, we got too few who have gone on in the academic circles. So Yasmin was also here in my department of religious studies. And uh, she will be sharing with us so also a change in title. So let me sit down and shut up and uh, present you with Neil Roberts and uh, his 20 minutes. <laughs> Oh man, the burden of 20 minutes with the clock. Well, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, uh, it is a delight. Well, I was trying to figure out whether this was a panel on freedom or the Brown alumni panel. I wasn't really sure. But it looks like it's actually both, right? We call it the two for one, as Arendt said. Um, and so uh, I'll, let me get right to it. But I do want to thank. Um, uh, Juliet Hooker and Melvin Rogers and Michelle Rose uh, and also uh, all of you um, because in addition to the formal presentations I found particularly generative the question and answer period uh, in all of yesterday so um, so once the uh, uh, once I get cut off that's okay because there's certain things that I can bring up uh, during that uh, during that time and so my revised talk uh, is entitled how to live free in an age of pessimism which uh, is connected to the book in progress that um, that's listed on the program. Uh, in Ta-Nehisi Coates's Between the World and Me, uh, in his uh, book-length letter to his son, he writes the following. In accepting both the chaos of history and the fact of my total end, I was freed to truly consider how I wish to live. Specifically, how do I live free in this black body? It is a profound question because America understands itself as God's handiwork, but the black body is the clearest evidence that America is the work of men. I've asked the question through my readings and writings, through the music of my youth, through arguments with your grandfather, with your mother, with Aunt Janai, your Uncle Ben. I've searched for answers in nationalistic myth, in classrooms, out on the streets, and on other continents. The question is unanswerable, which is not to say futile. The greatest reward of this constant uh, interrogation of confrontation with, brutal with the brutality of my country is that it has freed me from ghosts and girded me against the shared terror of disembodiment. Uh, I would submit Coates also uh, arrives at this similar conclusion in his collection of uh, Atlantic essays uh, that was published recently in uh, as uh, we were eight years in power. Uh, I think that there are reasons why uh, Coates expresses a particular form of pessimism, uh, and there are reasons why one may consider even his question, how can one live free uh, in this black body as, uh, as a paradox. Uh, but it might be a paradox or a quandary, but uh, I want to suggest that it is actually answerable uh, and my response to that answer will be the philosophy and the phenomenology we may call marinage or flight. How, I, how might we develop a conception of freedom that underscores the historical while revealing the theoretical and genera generalizable throughout space and time? 
How can we reconceptualize freedom to bridge the gulf between its hegemonic articulations and what I contend are the two main traditions in Western thought? The first we could call negative freedom, that is different notions such as freedom as non-interference on the one hand uh, and freedom as non-domination on the other, some of which we heard in the panel on recent republicanism yesterday. And then on the other side, uh, we can think of the positive traditions of freedom. Freedom notions such as autonomy, self-mastery, generality, and pluralistic humanism uh, as exemplary. How may we rethink, uh, how, how, uh, how may our rethinking repudiate such notions as positing freedom in immutable static terms, account for individual and collective imaginings of the free life, indict orders of unfreedom, or existence in what the Martinican thinker Franz Fanon called uh, in black skin, white mass, the zone of non-being, and discern the possibility for the realization of revolution. Uh, in attempting to answer these and other related questions, the result of which uh, was my 2015 book, Freedom is Marinage, I delved into processes of creolization, conceptions of freedom within and across myriad epochs, and the architecture of the black radical tradition. The breadth of this tradition uh, is transnational, as scholars including Angela Davis, June Jordan, Sheila Mbembe, Paul Gilroy, uh, Tracy Sharpley Whiting, Fred Moten, uh, Hortense Spillers, Christina Sharp, uh, Cedric Robinson, and others have noted. And it contains perceptive insights uh, into the imagination, the interior, and the exterior, and interstitial experience. I sought as a consequence to gain clarity of our understandings of black politics, radical, and the black radical tradition undergirding what I, have call, uh, what I conceive of as the free life. The short version of this is not everything is radical. You know? I feel like a lot of times you see blogs, articles, as something X, Y, and Z and the black radical tradition. X, Y, and Z, black radicalism. It can't all be radical. Uh, and so I just want to be able to, I'm trying in the book I'm finishing to discern some of these distinctions. Black politics comprises viewpoints, ideologies, and actions spanning the political spectrum. Scholars in the United States, however, unfortunately tend to think of black politics in provincially nationalistic or hemispheric terms. Such a framing obscures genres of black visions between past and future. Black politics includes yet exceeds the US and the wider Americas, and there isn't anything intrinsically radical about its various articulations. As Walter Rodney, Donna Murch, uh, Kinga, Yamada Taylor, uh, and many others, uh, including Lester Spence as well, note, the neoliberal turn in black politics, reflections on international development, and black political economy are reminders of the heterogeneity of black agents' opinions on black interests, notwithstanding important areas of issues convergence. Black radicalism, however, to describe a political tendency within black politics uh, is not merely its critique. So one of the other elements I'm trying to argue is that uh, it's often framed as there's something called black politics over here in its liberal, libertarian, and conservative forms, and the black radical tradition over here as a critique of that, uh, but I think we should think of black, the black radical tradition, whatever, whatever that is, to be within this larger spectrum. So to be radical is to be you guys are looking at me kind of left of center, <laughs> and often in recent years to the left of quote unquote progressive, which is a vague classification, much like being, you know, people say, say I'm not religious, I'm, right, I'm spiritual, right? <laughs> you know, you're trying to figure out, sounds great, but what does that mean, right? Um, so it's rather than uh, uh, religious, but of the political disposition that at times encompasses the liberal yet is frequently short of the radical. So just look at authors, for instance, that The Nation magazine publishes now compared to the 1990s and before, uh, and you get the point. So if radical isn't necessarily a progressive, then is radical a militant, as Alan Badur argues, or, uh, or something else? In volume one of the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey, Garvey writes, quote, radical is a label that is always applied to people who are endeavoring to get freedom, end quote. Garvey, though, specifies a compelling outlook on the object of the radical instead of defining the agent itself. So what exactly is radical? Radical from the Latin radicalis originally meant of or relating to a root or to roots. The transformation of the term in Middle English, Middle French, and 13th to 15th century British English introduced definitions of radical denoting plant roots, a foundational mechanism, bodily organs, humors, and moisture vital to human life, functioning, and roots of a word. The long 18th century, otherwise called the age of revolution, brought about another definitional mutation. Not only did radical come to refer in mathematics to forming the root of a number or quantity, for the first time radical acquired a political valence, such as change or action, advocating thorough or far-reaching political or social reform, representing or supporting an extreme section of a party, and most importantly for our purposes, now more generally revolutionary. 
It is unsurprising then that Hannah Arendt located the shift uh, from revolution's astronomical backward, backward looking denotation to its modern forward looking political meaning. That is a new order of things, a birth, natality. At the same historical moment uh, that this, uh, that this uh, the same historical moment that radical obtained a political denotation. The repercussions, however, of Arendt uh, wrote about this through analyzing the American and French rather than the Haitian revolutions uh, are stark, and Arendt's overall disavowal of the agency of slaves are also crucial for us to comprehend. Black radical thought for centuries has responded to silences as well as disavows uh, in regarding the acknowledgement and denial of specific events. So, the black radical tradition then may be understood provisionally as a modern tradition of thought and action begun after transatlantic slavery's advent concerning centrally, the revolution, concerning centrally revolutionary politics and preoccupation with freedom for the souls of black folk. In the 1983 text Black Marxism, Cedric Robinson furnishes a classic genealogy of this. One distinguishing feature of Robinson's account in his examination of what he calls racialism and claim counter to numerous periodizations of humanists and social scientists that the emergence of racial orders and racial difference in Western Europe occurred prior to Europeans' encounter with non-Europeans and thus before the modern age. Robinson's inquiry into the radicalization of the Irish vis-a-vis -vis the English is exemplary. Another distinguishing feature is Robinson's analysis of what he terms racial capitalism and the extent to which black radical politics and attendant modes of resistance respond to the phenomenology of unfreedom experienced by blacks in Africa uh, and the African diaspora due to the advent of slavery uh, and the transatlantic slave trade. Walter Johnson and Manisha Sinha state in a recent Boston Review retrospective on the book that Robinson, quote, argues that the historical development of capitalism and racism were inseparable and a return uh, to the insights of racial capitalism will facilitate the black radical tradition's revival. Echoing Robinson, uh, uh, echoing Robinson, though not naming him as such, Ashila Mbembe, in his recent critique of black reason, uh, states that, quote, the birth of the racial subject, and therefore blackness, is linked to the history of capitalism, end quote. Mbembe's remarks, as well as the chapter Requiem for the Slave, uh, states, racial capitalism is the equivalent of a giant necropolis. It rests on the traffic of the dead and human bones. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll uh, kind of pass through some of this other discussion, but uh, in addition to critiques of uh, black Marxism, uh, but while black Marxism shall remain a vital tome, it does have its limitations. Black women radicals, Marxists and otherwise, receive little, uh, little treatment, and even before the, the periods that he talks about, as we'll hear also uh, soon with regards to Harriet Jacob and others, the book ontologizes black culture and by extension the black radical tradition, thereby eclipsing the tradition's heterogeneity and dynamism. It also contains a useful but also too concise delineation of marinage that only broaches the surface of its true significance. Subsequent treatises on black feminist thought and the black radical imagination are essential corrections. Uh, and moreover, uh, re, uh, more rethinking, however, is needed as it may, as a consequence, call into question whether we're describing the black radical tradition in the singular or black, the ra black radical traditions plural. The radicalization of the black radical tradition or traditions highlights how the lived, uh, have the lives and lessons of what Fanon called the damne, the damned, the condemned, the enslaved, are essential bulwarks between past and future for revolutionary change and cultivating freedom. Acts of marinage, I've argued, uh, in, their different, uh, in their different types and forms, an inquiry into the liminal and transitional spaces of slave escape between poles of political imagination exemplify this. So unlike what John Hope Franklin argued in his seminal text from Slavery to Freedom, the philosophy of marinage is not a from to, right, but it's as. It's the actual process of our different flight uh, from different, uh, different flight from different regimes of enslavement uh, across uh, time. Therefore, put tersely, freedom is not from to, but rather as. Okay, because I know my time, time check is getting short. You got eight minutes. Eight minutes. All right, so why marinage, or how, as Angela Davis asked in lectures on liberation and freedom is a constant struggle, how do we know when we are becoming free? Um, the idea of marinage historically referred to Spanish feral cattle who then took uh, escape uh, and then went to the hills. So if we recall the tsunamis in Southeast a in, uh, East Asia uh, a few years ago uh, that killed several hundred thousand people, one thing we know from GPS tracking is that the elephants, a few days before, actually went into the mountains because they were sensing that there was going to be something uh, coming. And then after the tsunami hit, then the elephants then went back 
down. Uh, in, the, in the New World context, uh, initially the idea of Maranaj referring to Spanish fuel or cattle fleeing to the hills, then indigenous Amerindians taking flight from plantations, and then by the 1530s enslaved Africans trying to create autonomous uh, communities on the one hand within a larger state, uh, and then on the other individuals taking uh, flight, such as uh, Frederick Douglass uh, in his writing about in his different autobiographies, or Colson Whitehead, for those who have read the Underground Railroad, right? the protagonist Cora, who then is on a Georgia plantation, who then is in trying to escape through the swamps and the marshes, eventually making, her, making the way uh, by the end of the novel without giving it out uh, in the Midwest. Uh, and so on the one hand, people may think Maranash historically is Janus face. It explains either individual escape or collective individuals tr trying to form collective communities or in collective spaces within a larger regime of enslavement, but it doesn't uh, take into account traditionally in treaties and also how historians and anthropologists have thought about it, the actual uh, restructuring of a social and political order. And so what I've tried to introduce in calling uh, two terms, the idea of sovereign marinage on the one hand and sociogenic marinage on the other, is to think about what does it mean to transform a social and political order itself as a form of flight, not merely physical, but also the actual restructuring of, uh, of a polity uh, from the, uh, the only time you'll hear me use the term trickle down. You know, I think of sovereign marinage as trickle down freedom instead of trickle down economics, <laughs> speaking of the neoliberal turn. The idea of sovereign marinage, what does it mean for a, a collectivity like us here to then have freedom trickle down through some type of sovereign? Sovereign entity, call it a, a deity or a god or a deity or a political leader, uh, and then it, and it go down. And then sociogenic marinage, taking from Fanon, the idea of trying to forge becoming free from uh, from the ground, uh, from the ground, uh, from the ground, uh, from the ground up. I would be remiss to then not actually mention the ways in which uh, this idea gets misrepresented uh, in the current debate uh, between. You guys know these groups, Afro pessimists. And the Afro optimist, uh, Michael Dawson, in his longer paper, actually had a discussion. Uh, he didn't talk about it yesterday. Of uh, Afro pessimism, Juliet Hooker, I believe, had his, his discussion. And many of you have been in Scots. But it's funny. It's a debate where there's a one group called the Afro pessimist, and then there's a single Afro optimist, Fred Moten, which is very interesting. Uh, Fred Moten, of course, has a recent trilogy, not only Black and Blur, uh, The Stolen Life, and also The Universal Machine. But it's really there is really these two camps, some of whom avowedly say they're Afro-pessimists, others who then uh, don't actually uh, agree with that label, but nonetheless, there's something that is indicative here. Um, Afro-pessimists and Af the Afro-optimists uh, are, are indicative of two contemporary positions that take seriously the condition of the enslaved and the question of freedom. However, despite their differential articulations of their respective camps and divergent opinions on whether slaves ever avoid, in the language of Claudia Rankin, the condition of constant mourning, Afro-pessimists and Afro-optimists startlingly share a fundamental conviction, which is the following uh, conviction, which is the belief that slaves across epochs exist in what Orlando Patterson prominently calls social death, which is as a consequence of three ideas, three notions, the condition of power, powerlessness, dishonor, and natal uh, alienation, the belief that slaves are said to lack an inherent capacity for action. In other words, in my view, not Patterson's language, slaves are, social death is the living zombie. And the idea that anyone who can become free, it has to be an external agent who then grants, either grants your freedom as Glissant would critique, or uh, makes the slave uh, become free. And this is why in slavery and social death, Patterson spends so much time, for instance, talking about manumissions. Afro-pessimists and Afro-optimists incorrectly conflate Fanon's idea of the zone of non-being, I'm arguing, with the idea of social death. Because in the first three paragraphs of Black Skin White Mass, Fanon says, Black Antillean in the colonial period and the period of enslavement descends, like Dante's right, circles of hell, into the zone of non-being, which Fanon says is a sterile and arid region in which an authentic upheaval can be born. Meaning, that Fanon was arguing that as hellish as the zone of non-being is, as hellish as it means to be a slave across time, the phenomenology of our existence as a slave creates not the guarantee, but it creates the capacity or the possibility of coming into not just consciousness, but self-consciousness, the self-reflective ability for us to realize our condition, which is the possibility to say, you know what, there is another world possible. Or as Audre Lorde says in Sister Outsider when she says the most fundamental idea that uh, blacks in the modern period have to realize is that you were never meant to survive. Mm. And yet, here we are. Mm. So this conflation, if you're following, between social death and the zone of non-being is something that, quite frankly, why I don't even bother with this whole Afro-pessimist, Afro-optimist debate in any serious content, because it's missing what's fundamental to the concept of marinage is the belief that however difficult it is to actualize our consciousness of our intrinsic capacity for action and change, 
that that change nonetheless is possible, whether or not, whether or not it is our individual conceptions of freedom on an individual level of escape, as Edris Dantikat would talk about in The Children of the Sea, sometimes it might not be a collective escape that we have to. Sometimes we may have to take our chance on a raft or doing something else in an arduous space, like Cora in Underground Railroad. Or it is something at the sociogenic level where we're all from the bottom up trying to then think about the world that, uh, that may be. Uh, since I have only uh, two, two and a half minutes, I just want to end with this, but uh, there's a lot more I could say, um, including discussing uh, Frederick Douglass. But nonetheless, uh, I want to reiterate this. Traditions, we must remember, still have multiplicities and competing ideals. Modern traditions after the Treaty of Westphalia operate overwhelmingly within the structures of the nation state. The nation state, however, doesn't interrupt modernize, as many might argue. I believe that, if anything, the nation state with its modern and late modern shortcomings catalyzes modernize in its fugitive and long durée challenges to statecraft legitimacy. Structures, uh, and this is important, uh, because as much as Jim Scott, James Scott's work has been so influential to many of us, um, and especially in the art of not being governed more, most recently, uh, Jim actually mistakenly conflates the idea of rule and governance. Structures of rule and governance mutate across time and types of marinage exist prior to, during, and after moments of transformation. The desire for rule, uh, which isn't to be confused, fused with governance is an aspiration of the central agent underlying sovereign marinage. Governance, in contrast, is a condition of what Arendt called no rule, uh, or of what C.L.I. James called the idea in his pamphlet that every cook can govern, right? Of neither ruling nor being ruled. Governance is an outgrowth of the masses' sociogenic flight. What follows here then, and I promise the last paragraph, right? What follows here is not, as James Scott writes, the art of not being governed, but rather the ongoing art I call of no rule. By adopting this framework, we are better equipped to interpret individual and collective actions, social movements, popular uprisings, rebellions, revolutions, and how we understand the relationship between race and political theory, in addition, more specific to our panel, of how the idea of freedom pertains to them. So uh, in short, in trying to think beyond the gulf in Western thought between negative and positive streams of freedom, beyond the ideas of thinking about freedom in solely static terms, uh, and beyond the pro nationalist provincial understandings of what the black, black radical tradition is, I'd like us at least to meditate, even if you all think I'm wrong, to at least meditate on the possibility that if social death, as both Afro-pessimists and Afro-optimists fundamentally mistake mistakenly conflate with Fanon's idea of the zone of non-being, if slaves actually have the capacity for change, then that means a complete uh, reshifting of the very concept uh, of freedom, even if it's, as Coates mentioned at the beginning of Between World and Me, one that's an uh, inconvenient truth. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Neil. He came in right at 20 minutes. I don't want you to feel rushed, though, brother, but um, <laughs> let us take, a, since he called us to a moment of meditation, can we take a breath before Yasmin jumps in? And uh, I did not say, I did not say much about, I didn't say anything, actually, about your marvelous text, Radical Dharma, that... Uh, she co-authored with Lama Rod Owens and uh, Sister Reverend Angel Coyota Williams. And uh, that text has been uh, quite a uh, very accessible text and it's dialogical. So she co-authored it, but it's dialogical in the breaking bread sense, I think, mm -hmm. how you guys laid it out. This text has been um, kind of a hit with the students who brought it to me because it's, it's doing so much empowering kinds of work at the very fundamental level. So I didn't want to neglect to, I didn't want to leave that out since I mentioned his text. I said, let me do this sister some justice. Um, but okay, I think we're ready now All right. for your, your big 20 minutes here. And then we'll take a second and then we'll, I'll, I'll get to the question. So oh. yeah, it's me. Thank you so much, Andre, and thank you so much, Neil. This is an incredible. Okay panel to be on. I'm really, 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 really blessed to be here. And thank you, of course, to Juliet and Melvin. This is an incredible convening, epic, as I posted on Facebook. Um, so I did change the title of the talk. Now it says, uh, the, kinds of, the kind of lost her freedom cost. The kind of lost her freedom cost. Harriet Jacobs, abolitionist theory of contract and captivity. 
And so I was inspired by Neil's presentation to begin in the words of Miss Major, the black trans woman and queer liberation elder who threw the first brick at Stonewall, who says, we are still here. Mm -hmm. So in one of her most uh, well-read and oft-cited books, Our Prisons Obsolete, uh, Angela Davis writes, to assume that men's institutions constitute the norm and women's institutions are marginal is, in a sense, to participate in the very normalization of prisons that an abolitionist approach seeks to contest. Her study of women's experiences of inc incarceration is then not only an extension of her work as a feminist, it includes those often marginalized within the field of prison studies, not only because they represent her own political affinity for or identification with this particular population, because she brings an abolitionist analysis that requires we um, interrogate our assumptions about the difference between glory and guilt guilt and innocence, respectability and deviance, perpetrator and victim. As many of you know, abolition is more than a movement for Davis or Du Bois or Douglas. Abolition is more than a political ideology or a historical movement of a certain era, either to end slavery or realize the obsolescence of prisons. Abolition is, as gay Teresa Johnson and Alex Lubin write in the Introduction to Futures of Black Radicalism, quote, the destruction of racial regime and racial capitalism. A radical protocol, I argue, for learning to tell what time it is, for learning to read the writing on the wall, or as Dr. Martin Luther King reminds us, how the moral universe bends towards justice. Rather than imagine abolition as a top-down breakdown of intersecting structures of racial capitalism from above, or an overthrow of an insurgent takedown from below, my work traces the movement of abolition as an inside job, as an embodied practice of breaking through carceral imaginations of freedom to live in the loopholes of the peculiar institutions, criminalization, policing, and punishment that have evolved to shape political ideals of emancipation, race, place, gender, and belonging during slavery and in its afterlives within the U.S. and all places subject to its jurisdiction as the 13th states. So the paper I submitted for this panel is part of my current book project, Fugitive Acts, Black Feminist Abolitionisms, and Fugitive Acts asks how do black women abolitionist narratives, testimonies, letters, memoirs, speeches, and essays retreat from the kinds of freedom free people hold dear to articulate a kind of freedom as fugitive slave and abolitionist mother Harriet Jacobs writes in 1861 that is not yet realized. Rooted in the 19th century writings of anti-slavery abolitionist Harriet Jacobs, namely the implications of her initial escape from slavery documented in the narrative to a tiny garret space she refers to as her loophole of retreat, Fugitive Acts theories is a relay of black feminist abolitionisms between the time of slavery and the rise of mass incarceration to teach us how the work of black feminist abolitionisms bend the arc of the moral universe to in defense of criminalized lives, documenting how criminalized communities create themselves, their own conditions for protection, and their own conditions of possibility for what liberation feels like. So this is from chapter two, and it begins with a quote from Harriet Jacobs that says, the more my, li my, mm, sorry. the more my mind became enlightened, the more difficult it was for me to consider myself an article of property and to pay money to those who had so grievously oppressed me seemed like taking from my sufferings the glory of triumph. So the passage above appears in the last pages of Harriet Jacobs' slave narrative and um, is this proclamation of the wrong of manumission. And it emerges somewhat unexpectedly from the pages of her now classic testament to the wrong of slavery. Rather than rejoice at the moment of her lawfully recognized freedom, um, and emancipation from slavery, she mourns the lost legitimized freedom costs fugitives from their place in the institution of the enslaved. These kinds of freedom, legal and legitimate freedom, came at a cost, both monetary and moral, to the fugitives themselves. There was no justice in this kind of freedom, particularly for a fugitive who would rather risk her life than remain enslaved. There was no glory, no redemption in this practice of liberation from the shackles of slavery. It was a practice that relied upon secrecy, concealment, and disguise. For Jacobs, it was a practice, it, its price was part of the deeper wrong, um, the title in uh, Britain of her manuscript, the deeper wrong of her subjection. The terms of her victory were bound by the same legal system that continued to hold others bondage, in bondage. The terms of her victory denied her the right to see herself as something other than an article of property, 
The terms of her victory reinforce the indefensibility of her life as a thing, as assailable, as an object, leaving her and the two children, now only hers to own, own vulnerable to the will of others, even once freed. So Jacobs, no longer fugitive, laments what is lost in the welcome of the law's embrace. She is not nearly resigned to freedom's dispossessions of fugitive time and the possibilities of uh, lines of flight, the possibilities lines of flight could afford. This uncompensated loss was more than worth her mourning. This was something akin to triumph in the, and there was something akin to triumph, triumph in the telling of her story of liberation something that rejects the seductions of domesticating narratives, those politics of respectability that recreate fugitive time in their own image, yoking suffering to redemption, promises of progress that have all but lulled us into forgetting how to remember how we got free. In writing, by her own hand, a narrative that retreats from the protocols of the past and dares to speak the broken promises of their pretense to all those present, there rings Jacob's defense of what she claimed to be something akin to freedom. So I argue that we inherit Jacob's narrative and Civil War correspondence and what follows as a series of fugitive acts of prophetic praxis, methods and theories of abolition that reclaim black reproductive labor as a politics that can neither be domesticated or dispossessed, though they are routinely surveyed, policed, and punished. It is a freedom draped in the glory of the triumph of its victory over containment and domestication. The identity politics and moral ambiguities that govern her text, the only of record to have been authored by a fugitive woman, challenge even contemporary common sense notions of what victory over adversity might look like. Rather than tell a story of liberation that championed the cunning or physical force of her own individual will to overcome the bonds of captivity, Jacob's narrative places the fugitive mother within a greater community, a ground, an underground network of nameless friends and accomplices whose collective reproductive labors, labors do not only resist slavery, they animate the very fugitive futures. Slavery's domestication of black life suspends and advance the cause of abolition against the bonds of both contract and captivity. So what glory then uh, can come in risking the rewards of political belonging and recognition? Might there be glory in remaining fugitive even once freed? I open my reading of incidents with the limits many mission imposes on its author and protagonist in order to pose a simple question. Why isn't legal freedom enough for Jacobs? As Sadia Hartman so eloquently states in the introduction of Scenes of Subjection, the effort to examine the event of emancipation is no less riddled by inescapable ironies, the foremost of these dis being discontinuity between the substantial freedom and legal emancipation. Of the many inescapable riddles that mark Jacobs' fugitive escape from slavery to manumission to abolitionist. Here I identify 11 in the paper, not here today. <laughs> I'll just talk about a couple. Um, <laughs> each section begins by accounting for the kinds of loss her freedom costs. They name by negation the ideals of freedom, slavery deferred, no will, no guarantee, no home, no fiction. Um, those very Western attachments to freedom free people hold dear, derived from Jacob's account of her retreat from both slavery before the Civil War and the security of natural belonging, national belonging during the war and following legal emancipation, this litany of loss represents the interstitial inhabitations of freedom formerly enslaved people found to move into collective critique of both slavery and the kinds of freedom its end made all but inescapable. If, as Hartman suggests then, the kinds of freedom the end of slavery emancipated us into are truly inescapable, then no amount of our returning to these narratives of resistance, as Neil was saying, can help us get on with the unfinished work of abolition we face today. If, however, we learn to pay attention to how the reproductive labor of their fugitive movement continues to bring something long hidden from view into the present day frameworks for thinking about the ethics of freedom and the ends of liberation, then perhaps there is still much as yet unrealized, as Jacob writes in the relentless mourning of black mothers and in the incidents of the lives of those still held in bondage. So this is no home. As we near the end of Jacob's account of her escape from slavery, we find there is, in fact, no home for her and her children, and no rewards of glory bestowed on her manumission, none, save perhaps those produced in the retelling of her story. 
homeless but free, lawful but nearly lost to the archive of the abolitionist tradition, Jacob's narrative represents a dream of glory that neither ends that ends neither with the bill of sale that ensures her freedom nor with the national victory of constitutional emancipation. Rather, she chronicles her dream of glory as a narrative of liberation brought to life by the clandestine political communities whose labors made them possible. That's her readership as well. We're also talking about the white woman of the North. This is an unlikely motley crew of allegiance um, that I think is really generative of the kind of politics she desire. So Incidents was written by herself, as she writes, to arouse the women of the North, but did not work, uh, but did not work alone to break the silence of 19th century respectability politics by going public with its sordid tale of triumph over slavery. Despite the ways the state, as ethnic st studies scholar Lisa Lowe reminds us, subsumes colonial violence within narratives of modern reason and progress, the circulation of Jacob's Testament against slavery and others like it continued beyond the time of emancipation throughout the era of Reconstruction and Jim Crow and was lifted to canonical status with the arrival of the late 20th century struggles for civil rights and the vote. Uh, black feminist scholars in particular uh, bringing the history of women's resistance to slavery back into the literature led to its authentication and then its canonization and literature syllabi. Um, though she herself laments that there is no home for her and her children at the end of her narrative, inscriptions of their dreams of freedom are nailed on the trap doors of the peculiar institution and residue of its as yet unrealized um, elements remain emergent some hundred years later in American literature syllabi in various corners of slavery studies scholarship. Too often the story of the triumphs of fugitives and outlaws remains submerged, however, within patrilineal histories of abolitionist activism, histories that malign the thinking and tactics of those less respectable figures who advance its cause within its fold through reproductive domestic labor. Nationalist narratives written by those who championed ab abolitionists, uh, abolition's final destination as safe harbor in the North continue to conceal the as yet unrealized imaginations of freedom and dreams of glory that were the property of fugitive slave women, mothers, and uh, children in veils of shame. The kinds of homemaking incidents defends evidence contrary to common sense notions of political agency that political recognition and national incorporation are not always the primary or most advantageous aims for social acts of political resistance. As historian and social uh, critical theorist Cedric Robinson reminds us, creative refigure, reconfigurations of Western concepts live other lives within artistic renderings of the black experience of black suffering. And though they have a tendency to be conscripted, commodified, and consumed, they often resurface in ways that prove credible to projects of liberation their creators could not have imagined. The kinds of homemaking incidents defense also evidence, as feminist studies scholar Gina Dent reminds us in her editor's note of uh, black popular culture, how contestations over oppositional claims to blackness persist even within the milieus of people that make them up themselves. That diversity of expression and protocols of debate that make up black social and political thought are generative of a, new, of a kind of knowledge praxis that is radical precisely because it refuses the paternalism of universalization, not, all monolithic, um, not at all monolithic in its nature. So at its best, its dispersed roots of connections and exchanges retreat from possessive in relations to property and ownership and reach underground to circumnavigate the identity politics that so often organize, tokenize, and commodify creative labor. In this instance, it is not the case that racial marginalization serves as an ontological ground for self-identification or world-making. Rather, an analytic categorical marker of identity through difference, blackness is an episteme, a way of knowing the self in relation relation to one's material proximity to political authority, or, as Dent writes, it's a knowledge practice rooted in the erotic, quote, not in its most general and uh, colloquial sense, but in the way that Audre Lorde has defined it as our deepest knowledge, a power that, unlike other spheres of knowledge, we all have access to, and that can lessen the threat of our individual difference. For Jacobs, being black is a knowledge practice of congregational escape from the living death, death of slavery. It required taking flight from a gendered relationship to domination that was deeply racialized, not once, but as a practice, not alone, but in concert with others. So there's also no saviors. In a passage that uh, concludes the chapter, What Slaves Are Taught to Think of the North, Jacob's narrator, Linda Brent, introduces her readers to the fantastic 
personification of an illiterate enslaved woman's dream of freedom. Queen Justice emerges as a moral critique of the wrong of slavery with political consequences, material consequences, fashioned by the enslaved themselves over and above studied canonical defenses of abolition uh, mobilized by the free people of the North. Quote, one woman begged me to get a newspaper and read it over. Linda explains, describing the encounter with the poor, ignorant woman. One of the narrative's nameless chorus of friends. The woman had sought out Linda, who was taught to read and write by her first mistress at the age of 12, to see if the paper could confirm something she'd heard from her husband about the abolition of slavery having come to pass at the hand of the Queen of America. While this fictive national matriarch seemed to hail from no particular origin and possess no historically legitimate legal authority, the queen was said to have arrived on behalf of black people who had sent word, uh, sent word to her of their enslavement. Quote, she didn't believe it, as a woman recalled, and so went to Washington City to see the president about it. They quarreled, she drew his, her sword upon him and swore that she should keep him, that, that he should help her make them all free. Though the chapter ends before we discover what news of abolition the paper did in fact contain in the fantasiful retelling of the nameless woman's rumor, Jacob presents her readers with a glimpse of the unfettered insubordinate fervor of the fugitive imagination of abolition. Quote, that poor ignorant woman thought that America was governed by a queen to whom the president was subordinate, chides Linda, and then confesses her own complicit desire to see the realization of the woman's fantasy. Quote, I wish the president was subordinate to Queen Justice. Queen Justice's arrival is not a a uh, practical solution to the problem of slavery. Rather, justice emerges as a missive ma matriarch, a waking dream sent north on the eve of the Civil War to defend the insurgent political authority of the dispossessed. Though fleeting, Jacob's invocation of Queen Justice seeks to realize a vision of abolition against a backdrop of Western political authority that could easily lead us to eclipse the course of unnamed couriers of the fugitive imagination, distilling the fugitive element of their writing into instances of radical singularity and exceptions to their race. Indeed, we might risk unsettling the political authority of the history of will altogether, according to Sarah Ahmed. One history of will could be understood as the evacuation of wish and want from will. The will requires meaning and force as that which can eliminate desires from human intention. So the black reproductive labor of abolitionist um, imagination in conclusion is a politics of the future. One that knows what time it is, knows that if the abolition of ra ra racial regimes and racial capital is possible, another world is necessary. One whose demands on the future call not for more future freedoms, but for more fugitives. We need fugitives to bore holes in the constraints of legal freedom and to get a feeling sense of what otherwise possibilities for liberation might look like. We need fugitives to remind us how our own imaginations of, imaginations of freedom have been born out of stealing away, retreating, marinage, congregational containment, um, complete with an improbable sense of unity, compassion, conviction, and possibility. We need fugitives to teach us how to remember what it meant to see on September 12, 1971, a man in upstate New York identified in the historical record only as a nameless black prisoner take to the mic on the last day of negotiations between prisoners and prison administrators at Attica to say to oppressed people all over the world, we got the solution. The solution is unity. We need to study why the public spectacle of solidarity with and among political prisoners poses such a clear and present danger to law and order politics. From the plantation to the prison, the realization of abolition's dream for the future will require. We tell our own stories, keep our own account of what counts, and share with all who will listen what time it is, where freedom lives, and if this is it. Thank you all.